Hi, Kurt Jackson here with uh, this, the first uh, Your Money Matters of the new year of 2015. Today we're going to talk about taxes, interest rates, and market problems. Um, as I'm doing this, uh, recording this today, uh, oil is at $51.02 a barrel. It was over $100 not, uh, not too long ago. We're at five and a half year lows right now. While that might be temporarily beneficial to you and to me, it's far more damaging than you could ever realize to the oil industry and even countries themselves. Now, why would we care about that? I mean, we're paying less for gas, right? Well, you got to look at the bigger picture. Almost 20% of all junk bonds that are issued in our country are issued by oil producers, uh, and they're held by banks, mutual funds, and asset managers, okay, uh, which are, you know, where our money is, where our retirement stuff is. Uh, and and these oil producers are not going to be profitable with oil prices in that fifty to sixty dollar range. Um, and because many of these oil producers have borrowed heavily to expand production, they're going to be put into dire straits if costs to get the oil out of the ground. Uh, you know, if it, it costs more, if it, I'm sorry, if it costs more to get the oil out of the ground than what we're paying for it um, or what they're able to sell it for. There's great danger for many countries as well. Venezuela has more reserves than any other country in the in the world. Yet, when they take that oil out, it costs them eighty to ninety dollars a barrel, and Venezuela can't sell it now at fifty one, you know, fifty one dollars a barrel, somewhere between fifty and sixty, without getting clobbered. So Venezuela is actually borrowing money to buy oil for their people, and with little revenue coming in, they're not going to be able to service that debt. Russia is, an, uh, is a male, uh, major oil producer, but oil must sell at $75 a barrel for them to break even. Uh, the Russian economy is already shaky because of the UK, Ukraine crisis, and now with it costing more to take the oil out of the ground than they can sell it for, Russia, Russia's economy is in turmoil. Canada the OPEC, uh, and the OPEC nations, even the U.S., are all feeling the effects of the lost revenue from the uh, falling oil prices. Now, many still believe that oil prices will fall as low as $40. Okay, we're almost to 50 now. The consensus used to be that they thought oil would settle around 60 or be around 60, but we're already well below that. And this spectacular, spectacular drop in oil prices could be the catalyst for a severe economic downturn. Um, and while we kind of tend to focus on our pocketbooks, and that's important, don't get me wrong, we also need to look at the big picture because even though we might be saving a dollar a gallon right now than what we were paying, uh, if our investments in the economy, if our investments tank, the economy tanks, it's not going to be good for us on a much grander scale. Okay, so uh, the alternative argument I've kind of touched on is that it's good for for us, for consumers, but the f most of us, most folks, don't have that much money left. You know, we've we've really destroyed the middle class, middle class, middle class with zero percent interest rates. So the benefit to consumers overall is going to be minimal at best. And speaking of low or zero interest rates, the rate on a 10-year Treasury bill today is, is at 2.25%. The 30-year Treasury is at 3%. So think about that. That's a 30-year Treasury. So the, the market's betting that we're not going to see higher interest rates for 30 years. So uh, some of, one of the, Tom Hagen is a guy I follow a lot. He tries to, um, he, he's a, a does the similar things that I do, but he also tries to keep a real good eye on, on the economy. He's saying that for a lot of us, we may never see 4% interest rates the rest of our lives. Now, I've always been a, a, thinking that the inflation was going to drive up interest rates because of all the money we're printing, but that money's not really getting back into the economy, so the velocity of money is not there, so we're not seeing that inflation, and from the way things look, it's doubtful that we will. Okay, so... Basically, the government's literally giving away the money they print at no cost. So this also means that us, the safe people, the people in the banks, people earn it, put money in the banks are earning nothing. And their principal's actually being deleted because they can't um, earn enough interest to live on that. And then you have inflation uh, that, that's out there. So um, how many Americans save for their future that way? And how are they going to build wealth if they can't earn interest? So I know you want to tell me that they'll make money in the stock market, but isn't that really, when you think about it, isn't that really fake growth? I mean, if you make gains and then lose them, how are you benefiting? 
The Dow Jones Industrial Average was 10,000 back in 2000. It was 10,000 again in 2010. And it's being predicted the Dow now, which is today at 17,607, would be will be back to $10,000 in 2020. So now think about that. That's an entire generation with no growth. Okay, during that generation, it would cost you know what the cost for food, energy, taxes, and healthcare would those have increased? Yeah, absolutely, they would have. So here's the one truth of wealth: wealth in general does not come from investing. The wealthiest people on the planet are the parents of the baby boomers or the silent generation. Uh, Tom Brokaw calls them the greatest generation, and they have 70% of the wealth in the United States. And they became wealthy because they were good savers, not investors. They learned to live within their means, and that's something that we don't do very well. I've been guilty of that, very guilty of that. So our goal is to show people, our, our, our friends, our clients, that saving is the methodology to achieve wealth. I guess you could call it getting rich slowly. And, and then we need to, to sh then what we can do for you from in my unique position is that I can show you that we have the best savings vehicles in the world. Okay. But in order for me to show those to you, we actually have to talk about them. So, all right. So now why do I keep ex in insisting that we've got an economic catastrophe that's coming? Well, where do we get the money for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, healthcare, infrastructure, military, all that, right? Now, there's three different ways. It's it's from tax revenue, basically. The first, how can we increase that? Well, there's there's three different ways. The first one is really to raise taxes. Okay, um, and I and I think that there's going to be some increases in taxes. I, I don't know that the tax rates are going to jump up that much, but they may. Uh, depends on who's in power uh, and how how that how that all goes. All right. So think about it this way. The the gross, the GDP of the United States is $17 trillion. We currently collect about $3 trillion of taxes at the federal level. That's Social Security, Medicare, corporate, and estate taxes. Then we collect another $3 trillion in taxes at the state and local level. And these include income, sales, property, uh, sorted, all the different taxes that we pay. So that means that 35% of that $17 trillion we, that we already produce is going to taxes. If that increases much more, we would have a socialist economy, and that's never worked in the history of the world. So, while it, maybe if if we raise tax rates, they will likely eliminate deductions for property taxes paid, state taxes paid, mortgage interest, charity, and even health insurance. Okay, so they're going to be able to get away with this because they're going to claim that these changes will only impact the wealthy because only wealthy people itemize on their taxes. Okay. Do you itemize on your taxes? If you do, then according to this, you'd be considered wealthy. So that's why you're hearing all these speeches about income inequality. They have to pay for all of these list, these programs, okay, that we just talked about. And they're going to take it from those who have it and give it to those who do not, okay? And then, but we just don't know what the definition of who has it and who doesn't, and that's going to continue to get lower. The, the level of who has it's going to continue to get lower and lower as they need more and more money to help these folks. So in the next two decades, we're going to see a magnificent transfer of your wealth unless you do something about it, and you need to do something about it now before it happens. Okay. The second way we can do that is to reduce benefits, and that's not going to happen, right? Remember the the Remember these two very important numbers. Okay, we keep hearing how Social Security is going to get cut and all that. I, sometimes I think they it will, and then the more I I look at what the government's been doing and what their track record is, I, I'm thinking that that's probably not going to happen. And these numbers kind of will will, will bear that out. There's currently 100 million Americans over the age of, of 50. By 2030, there's going to be 130 million over that age. The unf unfunded liability for Social Security and Medicare is over 126 trillion dollars and rising. Um, but in spite of that, we're not going to lower benefits because none of those 100, 100 million Americans or more are going to vote for it. Okay, so we can't raise taxes and we can't lower benefits. Well, what are we going to do? The next option is to have growth. Okay, it's going to be difficult to do probably for at least the next decade. Japan's had deflation for two decades in spite of printing trillions of dollars, and it's just recently fallen back into recession. Europe's beginning just beginning to experience deflation. And it will be it, it'll get worse. Germany, the largest economy in Europe, faces the same demographic issues that Japan has struggled with for two decades. This is also still occurring in spite of the European Central Bank printing trillions and trillions of dollars. 
South America is experiencing deflation with Brazil facing the greatest challenge. India and, Chi India and China just reduced their interest rates and are also printing money. And their growth rates have fallen dramatically to 2% and 7%. China has double-digit growth over a decade. Um, this drop in the in the growth rate is serious for them. China also has the biggest housing bubble in the history of the world. And when it bursts, watch out. It's going to hit us here hard. So finally, United in the United States, we have current growth of about 1.7%, and it's expected to remain below 2%. Now, I know the government just came out with a big quarter last quarter, but when when if you have and actually break down the numbers uh the and i don't have those in front of me but uh, some of the economists that i read that i trust very well uh, a lot showed that a majority of that growth was just from the difference of, of things with obamacare and that and that that's not going to uh, can be able to continue so um how are we going to pay for all these benefits how will we maintain our military how will we pay the interest on our debt and there's one way, and we're going to print money. If you think about, if you think we're printing money now, then you don't know how to spell the word print. We're going to give seniors their Social Security. The government won't care that you can't buy anything with it, all right? But you'll still get it, all right? So you must prepare for these very real challenges, all right? And that's what we do. That's what I do. I help people prepare for these challenges. We need to take our money that's out of the control of the government, which would be your 401k, your 403b, your 457 plan, IRA, SEPs, all of that stuff. Even the Roth, but to a lesser extent, okay? Um, those are really under the control of the government. Because think about it. The government tells you when you can take it or you pay a penalty, right? You've got to pay taxes on that at some point in time, except for the Roth. They tell you when you have to take it at 70 and a half. If you're not taking, let's say you don't need that income at 70 and a half, you have to start taking income from it. So the government controls all that. So what we help people do is take the money out of the control of the government. We've got some phenomenal tools to do that. If you'd like to know more about that, um, I, I have a, a way um, now that we're booking, I'm booking online appointments to try to see more people. So uh, I'm going to put a link below here where you can book a, uh, uh, a 15 minute quick meeting and I'll kind of go over some diff different things. If it's something that interests you, we can obviously expand that. Um, if you go and click on that and then click the smart retirement and then smart retirement strategy session and then book a, find a time that you and, and if you're married, you and your spouse can be on so we can kind of spend that time that we can do from the convenience of your office, your home, whatever. As long as you, if you're watching this, you're going to have the capability to, to do that with me. If you have any other questions, you can always email them, Kurt at kjfinancialonline.com. That's Kurt, K-U-R-T. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I hope that you uh, um, do something to protect your money and to protect your future, because that's what this is all about, because your money matters. All right? Thanks for tuning in, and if you like this information that we're sharing every week, uh, share the link with your friends, family, uh, whoever you care about. Thanks.